Hello? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed faculty members, and our honored research scholars. Now I request our HOC, Dr. Professor Shomajit Day, to present the flower bouquet to Professor Suman Chakraborty. We heartily welcome our chief guest, Dr. Shuman Chakraborty, our esteemed gathering. Shuman Chakraborty is a professor in the Mechanical Engineering Department of the Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, and Sir J.C. Bose Nayak has bestowed by the Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, and a recent winner of the National Award for Teachers presented by the Honorable President of India. He has been Institute Chair Professor, the Head of the School of Medical Science and Technology, and the Dean of Research and Development. His current areas of research include microfluidics, nanofluidics, micro nanoscale transport, with particular focus on biomedical applications, including medical diagnostic technology for affordable healthcare. He is the winner of the coveted Infosys Prize in the category of Engineering and Computer Science in 2020-2022 and the recipient of the Santi Shwarup Bhatnagar Prize in the year 2013, which is the highest scientific award from the government of India. He has been elected as a fellow of the American Physical Society, fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry, fellow of ASME, fellow of all the Indian National Academics of Science and Engineering, recipient of the G.D. Billa Award for Scientific Research, National Academy of Sciences India, Reliance Industries Platinum Jubilee Award for Application-Oriented Research, Rajiv Goel Prize for Young Scientists Indo-US Research Fellowship, Scopus Young Scientist Award for High Citation of His Research in Scientific or Technical Journals, and Young Scientist or Young Engineer Awards from various national academies of science and engineering, and recipient of Outstanding Teacher Award from the Indian National Academy of Engineering. He has also been an Alexander Vaughan Humboldt Fellow and a visiting professor at various leading universities abroad. He has a large volume of impactful publications in more than 525 top international journals with more than 15,000 citations as well as patents or licensed technologies and a unique expertise in technology development for the underserved population and community healthcare. Now I request Professor Shuman Chakraborty to present his talk. Good morning, uh, Hi. all of you, and uh, I am extremely thankful to uh, Somojit, Proloy, uh, Somnath, and all like my very young brothers and colleagues. And uh, just to reciprocate what Somojit, Somojit talked about right now, 
I mean, more than uh, you know what I inspire anybody, uh, it's my inspiration which comes from many young colleagues like them, and I keep on learning from them. And I give you one example, like uh, for a very brief period of time, I used to teach in Jadavpur University at a time when I was myself not a PhD degree holder. At that time, Somnath was my first batch student in a CFD class, my first batch ever CFD, you know, what I taught. And uh, currently I'm learning a lot of fluid structure interaction from Somnath. So, uh, you know, it shows that, you know, studentship never ends. And once a teacher uh, you know, gets, gets relevance, uh so uh
observational considerations so if you see for example you have say uh, planetary motion so you can think of say you no know, planet is moving in an elliptical path now whether the path is elliptical or not uh, you know the the proof came much later than the observation and many of these observations were substantiated just by geometry because geometry developed at very early stage of civilization and these all got substantiated at a time by you know real mathematical physical uh, basis when calculus came in so i would imagine that all the you know important uh, scientific principles were written in terms of concrete mathematical terms uh, mostly when you know calculus came into picture although you know based on algebra also so many things were there now uh, when data science is sort of you know at present uh, getting into many such problems and maybe you know a old problem revisited i will come with an example that what data science is doing is say you now for example a dynamics problem you now the the problem that i'm going to talk about today is basically dynamics in the human body cardiovascular system so if you have a dynamics problem it's basically some time series things are changing with time so in an experiment you can measure a certain variable so if you see now that uh, what we can extract out of this time series measurement you know, by systematically looking into this through algorithms is what mostly data science is talking about when we are explaining the physical world remember data science has lot of other things to do but when i'm talking about the physical world this is what uh, you know it is looking for so now when we are doing this you are invariably relying on measurements and measurements will have noise uh, you know measurements will have corrupted data latent variables and some multi scale physics maybe which you, which is not directly reflecting in the measurements maybe you are missing the scales altogether that means the scale what you are uh, you know to resolve to understand certain physics you are not resolving that at all and uh, you can overfit data you know that is also possible so in that respect what is largely unacknowledged in the scientific discovery process that in a scientific discovery there is observation just like what is done you know by measurements in experiments but there is an intuitive leap where human intelligence comes to construct a physical law from that observation so that intuitive leap from you know understanding and synthesizing the data to formulate a physical law current data science 
is it able to do it or you know what can we do more to you know extract more and more although in the limit it may it may be able to do it so uh, the challenge when we are working on a physical world problem is that we are perceiving a governing equation for example if you are solving a classical mechanics problem we are perceiving that newton's laws of motion are valid and accordingly sort of we are trying to formulate our you know problem and even in the entire physics based model or physics informed neural network model which currently is very popular essentially we are assuming that the physics is governed by those well known frameworks of differential equation or whatever integral equations now uh, the question is that when you are having data with some hidden physics that you do not know you already have a question whether those equations in those forms are valid or not and therefore there is a sort of a question about whether if there is a hidden physics that means the physics is not reflected directly by the equations whether your data analytics will be able to capture that i am giving you one example which you know everybody has uh, sort of studied in school so the famous uh, you know galileo experiment see galileo was revolutionary not because you know he he came up with any sort of uh, you know expressions with calculus but what he did is he came up with you know from observations he came up with physical laws which were later on substantiated substantiated by these you know very sound mathematical principles so this famous leaning tower of pisa where apparently you know galileo did some experiments with falling objects and it is reported we see in our you know at least school level books that from these experiments he inferred that irrespective of the mass all these you know reasonably small objects will actually fall on the ground from the same height at the same time now uh, this is something uh, you know just to give you a historical perspective there is a questionability to this this is currently believed by you know historians of science as a bit of a thought experiment rather than physically actually galileo did it but leaving that apart uh, what did galileo challenge galileo challenged aristotle's uh, you know previous assertion that objects of different masses and sizes will fall uh, you know at different times now aristotle was a great philosopher i mean one cannot undermine the intellect of aristotle and think that you know galileo is great and aristotle aristotle is useless not like that now if someone today is not having any understanding of physics and goes to the you know that in uh, that leaning tower and drops the different objects will actually find that aristotle's observation is true because different objects will fall at different times and then you know data science will tell you know that is that you know that is what it is supposed to do it is not that you know galileo also didn't know it so what galileo did is galileo had an had a mindset that these measurements or these observations could have an aberration due to the resistance of the wind you know which is like you know dependent on reynolds number and so many other things at that time those things were not known so he try to sort of design some controlled experiments where those effects were nullified so that you know without that resistance what is going to happen that truth would come out so all what it means that uh, galileo recognized the significant influence of air resistance and therefore uh, he conducted controlled experiments on inclined ramps to you know understand you know that effect and isolate that out from the law which is like h equal to half gt square so this required a leap from observation to you know the scientific rationalization and that is something which we are not currently in a position where you know data science could provide and this is where although directly data science is not uh, able to provide what we can see that if you have peripheral factors how can they factor into you know some of these physics models just like you know wind resistance in this case and try to figure out a sort of a you can say corrected physical law which will take that into account 
Now, you know, that is a classical physics you know, materials world. I, I gave an example. But the real example that I'm going to talk about today is human body physiology. Now, uh, you know, if you see human body physiology and if you see the, uh, you know, the, the, the different sort of, you know, connective networks in the human body, Without getting into the, you know, what are the names of each of these, I think that is not important. But what is important is to see, at least to recognize how different it is from an engineering world. You know, uh, I was just talking about that, you know, my years of teaching experience. And, um, you know, in, in a majority of these years, I have been teaching subjects like fluid mechanics and so on over the years. So, you know, everybody, uh, you know, when, when someone teaches for a reasonable time, feels that, you know, that person has understood the subject, you know, quite well. So, you know, I have uh, you know, taught this subject for several years, you know, to an extent that, you know, I, if I come to the class, you know, uh, you know, just after waking up, I can tell the same thing from the mind, you know, not that deliberately I have tried to remember, but, you know, this is what, you know, teaching years, same thing together will make you, you know, more and more asymptotic donkey. So that is how you know, things progress. So um, uh, in a way, I, I thought that, you know, I have understood most of the things of fluid mechanics because anybody who has studied undergraduate fluid mechanics, uh, irrespective of you know, which discipline, maybe civil, aerospace, chemical engineering, uh, mechanical, of course, and any other, you know, will have one bread and butter chapter. We say that if that chapter is not studied, then you know that undergraduate course is not done. That is flow through pipes or pipe flow. Now, you know, pipe flow is taught in, 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 in various levels of rigor and undergraduate mostly with some, you know, very simple uh, either and very simple analytical or empirical type of formula so that you can solve the real life problems and very in-depth physics at that level nobody would look for undergraduately. Now with that knowledge, what you can do is you can uh, analyze the fluid flow in pipes of very complex networks. If you go to a plant, say engineering uh, power plant, process plant, you will see very complex networks of pipes. And uh, a very common problem in the, in the engineering domain is you know, to find out stress in the pipe or you know flow through various branches pressure at various locations etc it commonly requires a bit of you know if a, if it's a simple system a electrical network analogy model will work just like series parallel and all those things you can use the circuit theory laws uh, you know to do it and uh, you know those cannot be undermined because those can convert a very complex problem to a very simple problem but if it if it is you know much more complex than that level, then people will go for a finite elements modeling of that one. And there are, uh, in fact, commercial packages which can do it for uh, different applications. Now, you know, this is such an example, you know, arbitrarily, I have just taken it from the net. I do not know which plant it is, you know, where it is. But, you know, if I were an undergraduate student, I would have been delighted if I had been able to solve this problem of this you know, flow through this one. Now, you know, so to that extent, you know, when I found that at least I have the know-how to do it, I was extremely complacent until and unless at some point of time I, you know, got to introduced about this. So this is the pipe in the human body. You can see here, and this is a sort of a blown up thing. So human body has arteries, veins, etc. We all know. So you have these large arteries and large veins. These are you know, the really, you can say, tens of millimeters in, in diameter. You know, the largest, for example, the aorta, very well known in the cardiovascular world. Now, uh, you have then small arteries, small veins, you know, those are a bit smaller. Then, you know, the baby arteries and baby veins, those are called as arterioles and venules. And, you know, if you see those, you know, for example, this is like an arteriole and this is like a venule, and they are connected by a network of, uh, you know, micro capillaries. You know, these these are, you know, literally called as, you know, micro capillaries in human body. So, starting all the way from, you know, that, uh, you know, macro to the micro world, you have this cascaded thing, and all these are, you know, very dynamic, flexible, and not only that, you know, there are events when these blood vessels are dynamically growing or changing, like, you know, when there is a cancer 
progression, there is a dynamic formation of new blood vessels, which is known as angiogenesis. So all what it means is that if you know, the, the complexity of this engineering you know, fluid mechanics problem is of whatever level, you know, this complexity is, you know, you, you really do not know what it is. I mean, now, in fact, we, we do not have much of a know-how. Having said that, school books will tell us something about the cardiovascular system and someone who has a bit of understanding of fluid mechanics, I think this can be a very good starting point. So just, uh, you know, recapitulation. So if you imagine, you know, uh, just like this network type of model, so you have a heart and you have four chambers. So you have different types of circulation. So I'm just, you know, showing it in the diagram to give you a bit of, uh, you can say, recapitulation of the summary. So the oxygenated blood, you can see these red lines are basically the oxygenated blood, which, which are basically due to the uh, influence of the pulmonary vein, the lung uh, effect uh, to the left atrium. And then this is transported uh, to the left ventricle here, you can see, and oxygenated blood is pumped to the aorta for systemic and coronary system. So that means basically, you have a pumping system. Systemic means basically uh, uh, oxygenated blood will flow around the entire body, which will supply the necessary oxygen uh, to different parts of the body. And coronary is heart's own uh, functioning, not the entire body, but heart's own functioning. So these are, you know, systemic and uh, coronary circulations. And there is another part of the circulation very important which is the heart lung you know, interaction which is pulmonary circulation where arteries transfer deoxygenated blood from the heart to the lung and then return the oxygenated blood to the heart so you can see the deoxygenated blood enters uh, you know from the vena cava to the right atrium so you can see that it is entering here and it is transported from the right atrium to the right ventricle and it is pumped to the pulmonary artery to uh, basically, you know, uh, have oxygen. This is oxygenation. So uh, it's this pulmonary circulation is actually making it oxygenated. And uh, you know, this chamber system in the heart makes sure that you do not have a mix up of you know, this oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. Now, uh, you know, therefore, these arterial systems, you know, the basic difference is that you know, arterial systems will have this oxygenated. Uh, you know that the pure blood and the venous will have this impure blood. Now the arterial systems, you know, because their job is to you know transport the pure blood. If there are uh, you know issues or abnormalities with that, you have, you have different you know arterial diseases, which are the primary diseases for the cardiovascular problem. Now there are many different. Art, you know, arterial diseases like coronary artery disease, you know, you have heart, it's one of the uh, important diseases. What is not normally known by, uh, or rather normally discussed by people in common is the carotid artery disease. Now, carotid artery, these are major blood vessels which, you know, provide the brain's blood, blood supply. So, uh, basically the brain has a blood supply and um, it is very, very important, you know, uh, because if the supply of blood to the brain is disrupted by some way, then you know the, the pure blood, then that is what is called as a stroke. So you know, common people will have a confusion between heart attack and stroke. You know, they are two different things altogether, although both will have uh, you know cardiovascular origin, but you know, stroke is related to you know the, the lack of supply to the brain. Now a stroke, which is a fatal, is one thing, but sometimes people, what they have is a sort of a mini stroke. That means that it is not fatal as such, but something has happened for a temporary moment. And uh, normally, uh, if you see that uh, the doctors, they may notice a particular sound, which is, you know, in the medical world called as brute, when listening to the pulse. This is a faint whistling sound, which is a sound, which is a sign of some blockage in the coron you know carotid artery it is not a strokes uh, you know sort of indicator but it's a potential challenge that might lead to a stroke and if you see about one third of the stroke strokes is due to the carotid artery disease 
but the question is that who is that doctor who will be able to you know analyze these and all so one has to look for more supportive evidences to actually come to very uh, you know conclusive recommendation and something if it, if there are you know mini strokes which have happened and uh, or which are likely to happen then and, and if that is sort of you know uh, a priori uh, you know if not predicted the chance factor is evaluated and accordingly the patient is managed then it can actually save a lot of lives and if you see you know how to you know, manage it you know it is very very difficult if you see the risk factors like diabetes family history of stroke high pressure high pressure uh, old age smoking uh, you know so many things which is you know so generic and so vague you know so many other uh, you know cardiovascular problems or even non cardiovascular problems could be related to these and to make certain conclusions about the arterial conditions uh, you know these are some of the diagnostic tests which people may have to do like cerebral angiography ct angiography mr angiography ultrasound of the carotid arteries you know so many of these things and uh, you know it is impossible to do this kind of screening for most of the people who are otherwise vulnerable and uh, even symptomatically these uh, sort of you know you, you may have certain things uh, you know which could be potentially that someone had such a mini stroke but these things could be for several other reasons and therefore these are all you know non specific so what the whole idea is that can we understand a bit more about how for individual patients blood is flowing in the carotid arteries and then take that as a recommendation along with several supportive evidences that a clinician will normally have to come up with a risk factor so i you know hemodynamics you know hemo means blood and you know dynamics is dynamics it's basically blood flow dynamics in the human physiology this in the physiological world is known as hemodynamics so if you are thinking about the carotid artery hemodynamics so the whole idea is that you know these are certain you know blow up uh, you know region so you can see that uh, you know the region where this carotid artery is you know you can have a blow up of this and there are certain names to this and i will come to you know more precise locations where we are talking about the where the carotid artery is located and try to see that whatever are the evidences that you have how can you construct a model to understand what is going on in terms of blood flow for that particular patient so uh, you know uh, for several years now the physics of hemodynamics you know how people in uh, you know, computational fluid mechanics or computational mechanics you know look into is to connect the medical imaging with mechanistic simulations this is something which is currently the state of the art so um, uh these are some of the images which uh, you know uh, which have been worked on with uh, uh, you know by uh, my student my phd student manideep uh, in in collaboration with the research group of uh, professor andrew wee from the university of melbourne uh, and you know uh, this uh, wang who is one of his phd students he had uh, you know some of these uh, images and uh, the whole idea is that with these images uh you can of course if you do not have such patient specific images uh, you know from the doctor you can always have you can refer to open source image database which is available but only thing is that with open source image database you may not have other supportive data for the patient which may be required to draw some inference so broadly if you see the first uh, you know objective is to have a geometric construction and if you see that at the end if you are solving a mechanics problem yes so this is 4d flow uh, means you have also the time uh, you know as a parameter which comes in so the if you have this up to 2d or you know 3d it's a frozen at a time so 4d uh, mri is something which uh, currently in many of the you know, common indian hospitals you will not get we got this from the, one of the hospitals in melbourne and uh, so uh now why you know these these kinds of you know data that you have not that you will get such data from all patients but this can help you to develop a physics based insight from medical imaging in a non intrusive manner in 
in in in whatever way possible and your objective so if you are solving a mechanics problem at the end be it you know water through a pipe or blood through such a complex thing you require the geometry and you require the boundary conditions and then you have certain equations which will try to solve the problem and then if you find that there is a deviation from what you observe and what the equation gives then you need to put some you know make some corrective measures out of that so uh, you know what the patient specific uh, aspect here uh, sort of we we are talking about is that you have a patient specific geometry now imagine that you know this patient specific geometry is available to one mri you know image so mri image what it will do it will mri uh, it it creates a magnetic field and with that magnetic field you will have you know maybe uh, sort of a, a, a transfer of this you know protons and you know, that will give a unique signature in the image now there is something which is called as phase contrast mri pc mri what it does is that on the top of that you inject some phase contrast agents like say iodine for example so what it will do is that you can see the phase shift of you know these you know say uh, uh, these positive ions maybe as a function of the velocity and if you calibrate it that means you you can get the quantitative velocity data so that you can get from the phase contrast mri, MRI but not the regular one will give the just the image without that velocity data so if you have the phase contrast MRI at one of those locations, you know, data, that means you have the velocity data available. And uh, the MRI will give you a uh, sort of uh, possibility of developing a patient specific geometry. But, you know, a lo lot of things are actually unknown, even if these, these two things are there. And but with this, you can construct a 3D model and then solve the so-called hemodynamics problem. But anyway, if you are solving, a, if you are putting up a 3D model and solving the problem and thinking that, okay, I have simulated 3D, that means everything in the world has been done. But there are so many uncertain, you know, inputs there that, uh, you know, that uh, like sort of advantage of doing a 3D is not always felt greatly because you know, many things are not actually put correctly. There is an alternative way of doing a one dimensional model which is in this case is an example of a reduced order model that means you have a high order model and you can reduce it actually the zero uh, zeroth order model is that electric network model where you do not have any sort of you know you know dimensionality just you are uh, writing uh, the uh, you know resistance uh, current etc now with both of these and you know one done uh, along with the other Two things can be done. One is you can look into you know the efficacy of one-dimensional model in capturing some of the aspects of 3D model that is important for a clinician. Now, what is very important while we are studying such a problem is not how nice graphs you can draw. It is what you predict is useful for the clinicians who are actually sort of in the domain of treating the patient. So if you want to do that, then you know there's even one D modeling might work for the purpose of the this clinician. So you can have a comparison between these. Not only that, if you have certain medical data, that means maybe physiology has established certain data, or even uh, you know you can look into uh, patient-specific data. You will find that you know these may be deviating from you know what uh, possibly is physically realistic for that case and that deviation may be because of many reasons including the uncertainty in certain data so when you are you know i am now coming to one of the major pointers of this talk so when you are thinking of solving a say blood flow problem through this carotid artery maybe you have got a very good uh, idea of the geometry thanks to your mri data Maybe you have got a very good idea about the inlet boundary condition velocity thanks to the phase contrast MRI data, but you may not have a good idea on number one, what is the thickness of the blood vessel? And number two, uh, what is the elasticity of the blood vessel, modulus of elasticity? Because you know it's not like a material testing lab that people will say, okay, take a you know, chunk of your 
artery and put it in a machine and you know find out the modulus of elasticity right so that is not uh, something that you know people will allow so question is how do you get it because if there is a significant discrepancy in that no matter how nice is your you know so called what i call as colorful fluid dynamic cfd that nice colors and you know pictures you know these will be very good for you know writing one paper after the other fine but it will help nobody except you know your career and your promotion so uh, now the question is that what we can do with these kinds of things and uh, you know try to see that it helps in some way so coming to this carotid artery so if you see that you know if you take the main branch and if you you know take it you know take some of the sub branches uh, you know it's quite uh, you know well represented geometrically if you take it from a medical image and you know construct the geometry now this is you know at one of the inlets uh, this is the flow versus time that you can measure from the phase contrast mri and if you know for flow versus time you may assume some velocity average velocity divide the flow by the cross sectional area now at the outlet you know nothing so for this this three element wind kessel model you know this was put forward by uh, you know by one of the you know phenomenal researchers uh, uh, you know not directly but indirectly uh, you know uh, this model came up from his work his name is otto frank and so what he did is he considered you know uh, so the blood vessel has a distensibility it is not a rigid thing like a you know say piece of iron so that distensibility means that at some point of time it can hold more blood and it at some point of time it can hold less blood so this holding uh, you know fluid you know as a function of time is like holding charge as a function of time it's like a capacitance equivalent so this entire outlet would be modeled as and i'm not getting into the details as you know two resistances and one capacitance in this way this is like a zeroth order model just like as i told that electric circuit equivalent now from you know some of the uh, you know uh, physiological uh, data or you know literature which has been established over the years it is possible to estimate this not may not be exactly but to a large extent so when you formulate such a problem you therefore have this uh, you know this is the common carotid artery this is our domain and you have this major external carotid artery it is um, uh, uh, you know if i tell that you know what are the percentages of this in terms of the total flow if this is 100% internal carotid artery will be about 70% major external will be about 25% and minor about 5% that is what roughly it occurs and doesn't vary much from one to the other so what we did is uh, you know of course after retrieving retrieving the geometry it requires a bit of you know of, uh, post segmentation after that there is a coarseness and there is a smoothening procedure and all these things are standard in the you know geometric modeling world and uh, you know that you can do and what we did also you know because for doing the one dimensional analysis we just extracted the center lines of these and this is uh, you know, uh, very easily done in an open source software known as simvascular which is an you know, open source software anybody can use so what we did is uh, you know for some particular patient say uh, uh, for the inlet the pressure waveform so you have this sort of you know pressure waveform which you uh, or, or the flow waveform whatever uh, you know the pressure flow whatever it is there say the outlet you have a pressure waveform so when you have a pressure waveform the physiology literature says that what is the form but it doesn't you know the value will vary from every person one person to the other so what we thought is that when any patient goes for you know such a disease management the bare minimum thing that the doctor will measure is the calf blood pressure and if we take that as a mean we can scale the you know values in that uh, sort of the standard physiological thing to uh, you know get you know the, the the, all the limiting values and you know then um, you know with that mean pressure it is possible to you know calculate the total resistance out of this circuit you know it's just a electrical circuit analogy and uh, then you know it's basically that means that the outlet you are having you know certain effective pressure and effective flow which is 
derived from this you know this uh, resistance capacitance model it doesn't take any dimensionality and fluid structure interaction you can use uh, you know any standard model this is one such example where you have the boundary between the fluid and the solid you know there uh, it's basically you can take a you know, kinematic approach to the uh, movement of the boundary that the boundary nodes they can move with the velocity uh, you know which is uh, basically the same as uh, you know that of the the solid nodes and the fluid nodes and uh, for the wall domain you know you are basically using uh, so s is the displacement and you are uh, having uh, this as the stress tensor and this is the body force so uh, what is normally done you see at the interface between the fluid and the solid you have uh, you know the stresses distributed so shear stress for example so that can be converted to a force because you know this is all these equations are basically force per unit volume so stress is force per unit area and normally it is scaled by per unit volume by dividing uh, thickness of the wall of the blood vessel and uh, if you are solving a linear elasticity problem you have a linear relationship between the stress and the strain and you, you have the modulus of elasticity and the poisson ratio that that comes in and you know there uh, you know typically you also have a factor ks which takes care of the how the shear stress is distributed in a membrane typically a parabolic distribution so it's basically membrane theory brought into the fluid structure interaction now this model is not something very great uh, you know and this is something which is even less great that is a one dimensional model so what you do is that you have a blood vessel and you have the three dimensional flow so you integrate it over the cross section and when you integrate it over the cross section you get one dimensional so s is the cross sectional area and q is the flow rate and there are some assumptions to this model and there is a great scope of making an improvement because you know one of the assumptions is that it's a this parabolic velocity profile which is which deviates if you go to the you know, junction of the blood vessel so there are you know possibilities i'm just showing you a uh, you know a, one such model how it works so you you have this uh, these are basically nothing but the equations of motion integrated across the section and you also have a bit uh, have a you can say this is a closer model the pressure locally how it is varying with the local area and the elasticity and the thickness so with all these you can close this model and then uh, it is computationally much less expensive to calculate this 1d model and you know with rigid and deformable things see these these three things are very important see if you go to a doctor doctor will not really look for you know what is vorticity and how you know these things are distributed doctors want three major things they call three hemodynamic parameters pressure flow and resistance just like an electric circuit so pressure and flow we understand resistance is the wall shear stress the friction at the wall so if you plot these you know with some input of the elasticity of the artery you see that there is not much variation between the uh, you know 1d and 3d although there is a significant you know uh, change when you go to the rigid and the deformable wall at least the peak values and the deformable one is actually you know damping these values down because basically if you have you know deformability you have more area of flow available and you know that will reduce you know, the stress now the question is that all these data you know that have been obtained you really do not know what is the wall thickness and you really do not know what is the elasticity so these are the two parameters despite having so many you know medical imaging inputs still you know there is missing now wall thickness you can actually measure but it requires a invasive procedure which is a uh, basically uh, you have to do uh, you know an ultrasound by entering catheter uh, you know uh, from another uh, femoral region so it's a invasive procedure uh, and therefore it is uh, not something which is commonly recommended but typically you you will have for many of the patients you know, on an average this is about 10% to 20% of the radius of the local radius so to that extent you know until and unless there are significant blockages this will not vary much but elasticity is something even if you are making invasive measurements you you are not able to have any idea so what we thought is that well you know let us do an uncertainty analysis just like in any experiment we do uncertainty analysis because experiments will have scopes of you know errors in measurement so here we took 
the wall young modulus modulus of elasticity and the wall thickness as the uncertain parameters and because you know in the range you know if you look across various patients every data is almost equally likely you cannot you know rule up one, one from the other so it is useful to have a uniform statistical distribution not a normal distribution and with that uniform distribution you know if you have a and b at the extreme values you know the mean and the standard deviations you know standard formula for that and the the mean is something which is well reported in the literature and the deviation is also well reported in the literature. so the whole idea is that when once you do a simulation and then plot the uncertainties on the top of these it is like as if you are plotting experiments with error bars upper and the lower bound which normally in simulation we never i don't try to do so we try to use a very you know uh, well established method which is known as polynomial chaos uh, well established uncertainty quantification method this method works very well if you have only a few uncertain parameters large number of parameters means becomes a very you know large series that you have to evaluate so uh, just to give you a broad idea what it tries to do any function say flow pressure etc you write it as a this series not really up to infinity but you know finite number of terms where you have a deterministic component and a stochastic component which is a function of your uncertain variables and uh, the stochastic components are normally expressed in the form of a polynomial b legender b hermite etc and uh, uh, there are two types of such methods one is intrusive polynomial chaos that means your navier stokes solver or whatever mechanics solver has to you know change because of that other is non intrusive that means that deterministic solver doesn't change you take care of the probabilistic part by the corresponding you know random function multiplier in the series so all what you have to do you, you truncate this expression up to this finite and we have there the two parameters in the uncertainty young's modulus and wall thickness and uh, then you take an inner product that is basically multiplied by this psi j and you know multiply with the probability density function and you know ensemble and then from that you can get an expression for these coefficients and uh, you know that will give us statistics so what uh, you know you can see here is that you have the simulation results now with error bars with the you know upper and lower bounds and so all what it means is that if you are doing a simulation which matches with some of the conditions of the patient you can tell a doctor that what could be the possible upper and lower bounds of the modulus of elasticity of the blood vessel where there is no way by which you can measure it so it's like a sort of a synthetic uh, you can say stress testing or universal testing machine that can be there so um, using this uh, and you know if you find out uh, you know the young's modulus uh and in one of the ways in in which you know how do you know that what whether your mean is correct or not it's a bit of an you know iterative algorithm where you you have this one from the medical uh, you know image data so you come up with you know your value of e it's by a little bit inverse model so long as you know you find that your 1d model and the patient data they converge and you know then you say that you know that's the correct thing now i'm not going for you know uh, in details for the rest of part of my talk because you know those are you know what are the supplementary things so for any cardiovascular patient it is not just hemodynamics but uh, you know you also want to see the for example the blood sugar and all those things so we have some you know point of care device technology so that's like you know this is something which is called as a glucokiva so this is a gluco you know, blood sugar measuring uh, technology you know uh, which is developed by uh, you know of course uh, uh, fundamentally by us but commercialized by a company called a smart qr uh, you know diagnostics so you basically have no uh, device we have, we know glucometers have that meter right this is meter free glucometer so all what you have is a strip and your smartphone so you take one drop of finger prick blood put on the strip and there are invisible reagents in the strip that will react and you take an image and do the image analysis and then you know that will give you a quantified value of the blood glucose very simple you can put it in a pocket and you know do it on travel you don't need anybody's help and you can do it with your own smartphone so uh, uh, similarly we have also have made you know lipid profile tests which is very important you can screen patients based on ldl hdl and triglyceride with a 
something which is a mini centrifuge, a lab on a CD on which you put one drop of blood and the CD rotates and the blood cells separate from the plasma and you test uh, you know, the LDL, HDL and triglyceride. Uh, within about half an hour, you can get this lipid profile result, which typically requires a lab. So now the question comes, see, all these things are there to support a doctor. Doctor wants to take a decision by understanding the physiology. Otherwise, the decision will have more empiricism, more experience and less understanding of physiology. So to do that, the doctor will always have some data. Like, you know, patient comes, typically the pulse, the blood pressure, these things doctor will measure uh, anywhere in the world. And uh, medical history, symptoms, all these things are there. So this is input level one. Uh, in, in fact, input level zero. Input level zero is what is input level one. When you basically extract certain keywords and you know from the medical history, input level one is you know other than this pulse and uh, this maybe uh, blood pressure, oxygen saturation. You can put additional sensors on the body. Nowadays, it is possible. Even smartwatch can be like a sensor. I know where you can get additional physiological sensing. Third level is you know some finger prick blood test you can do, and for analyzing all those data, you can put the hemodynamic simulate simulation in a visualized form. So with all these, you can create a package and give it to a doctor with certain you know uh, weightages of these risk scores. And these, what I believe, will give more insights to a doctor for a decision support overview as compared to what a doctor in a normal clinic will have. So in that way, uh, you know, it is possible to you know have a personalized healthcare where the healthcare follows not purely from physics, not purely from data crunching, but you know possibly a merger of physics and data science, and it can help in you know many people like for their personalized healthcare for the doctor in even for insurance policy makers that they will get an insight on you know the status of someone who wants to get into a medical insurance scheme. So in many ways, uh, you know what. I believe is that you know when we approach a doctor, doctor has an understanding from the inside, but our physiology is hidden to the doctor. Even medical imaging in the most advanced form doesn't give a lot of clarity on that physiology. So combining physics, data science, and some you know medical measurements which are possible, I think some aspects of the hidden physiology, so called, can be reflected and it can benefit on. So that's all what I wanted to present. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, they are within a range, but within that range, the variations can have a lot of effect. Uh, effect. So 4D MRI data is more in, in most of the cases, what we do is that we use it for training the time series data of uh, you know, our simulations. Now, because it is available in limited numbers, its current state of the art is its objective is to more, you can say, train the algorithm, you know, because your equations may miss certain things. So you can. For example, you can uh, sort of fit a better pressure waveform. You know, if you do not have that, what you will do? You know, if from the physiology book, you have a waveform, and you use that waveform with the cuff blood pressure as the mean. But from there, you can really, really get you know patient specific. So I would imagine that current state of the art is it is for training and testing. You know the the results of your physics informed neural network to some extent or maybe this polynomial chaos informed you know uncertainty analysis to some extent but uh, you know uh, because of its very limited availability but if the availability is more can we use that one to again narrow down the search space for absolutely that? absolutely absolutely you know for example i know imagine that if this is available for a wide cohort of patients on which you can do some meaningful patient specific statistics then yes definitely
is adding more and more experimental data to support those systems to have a better inference out of it, or we will also have some observations. I think that you know what I wanted to stress upon is the second aspect because see we will get you know explosion of data and uh, you know currently if you see you know some people say that uh, you know it is very important for a, perhaps everybody in this audience that when chat gpt can do everything then you know you know where are our jobs at stake and uh, you know in in everywhere in starting from teaching to writing papers you know i have found that you know uh, uh, I, I tried to write some essays to help my son's preparation in exam, and I found that at least ChatGPT does it much much better than me. That much, you know, for sure, you know, I I could realize. But uh, you know, the thing is that one has to see that at the end, what is that ultimate level of intellectual pursuit that someone in breakthrough research is trying to do? All of you have heard of Noam Chomsky. You know, the famous uh, you know american you can say philosopher so he told you know one very famous statement that at you know he is 90 plus and he doesn't have fear on anybody so he says that my interpretation of chat gpt is that it is a nice plagiarism avoiding software so uh, you know so all what it means is that we now know that we are all now safe you know i i you know as a teacher and as uh, you know guiding many students at some point of time, I know I thought that I told my students that do not typically, you know, pick and pluck sentences from any paper. Now with chat GPT, there is no fear. I will tell them that if you are picking and plugging for introduction, put it in a chat GPT, it will rephrase and then put it because, you know, that is okay. Even if I do not tell this that they will do, at least if they are smart. But this is not, you know, intellectual pursuit of research, right? This is just when you filling up that literature review part, which is important. You know that it's more of a scientific writing rather than scientific contribution. So when your scientific contribution comes, you have to imagine that there is a level of imagination where data is not able to give you that. So to extract that, you need to have this data science plus plus, and that plus plus should be the research of data science, not really you know what the regular you know things that data science can generate. I think that's going to be the future. Anyway, and that is where the domain knowledge is so important in data science. Thank you. No, I mean, I mean, you are correct, but if you see, uh, you know, uh, there are, uh, say, for example, human behavior. Now, human behavior, you know, is, is perhaps the most complex thing to model because there you do not have such bounds, you know, these are, you know, very erratic things. But for example, the modulus of elasticity now over the maybe uh, say you know 50 years or you know, over of this understanding physiology, it is understood that it can have a upper bound and lower bound. And perhaps you know that will be there in between where the patient's case is lying is where is the question. What my concern is more about is the is, is the is the domain knowledge is good to model phenomenon, but since un in uncertainty lies in the minus of what you have, so it no, uh, then then yeah, then so, the domain specific uh, you know this know how has to be changed or okay. you know, adjusted. Yeah, I mean, uh, so so the, the the question the second part of the question was that is is generative AI in those positions where we are trying to model such thing would help us to create new phenomenon no, or experiments. I mean, it, see, it it at that it will help in fitting only because see for example if someone has uh, say plotted that height versus time in a very controlled experiment of Galileo without understanding the law of physics. 
So it instead of t square, it will be t to the power maybe 1.98 right. right. or 2.01, but that 2 will not come. Yes. Right. That is what, you know. Thanks. Thanks. Actually, this, sir, there's a training for that observation. This is a you know when you have more data you observe less. You know uh, what? You know I have heard Doctor Vidhan Chandra Ray used to look at the face of a patient and by the patient's sort of you know movement and uh, you know body language, he will be able to screen the patient. May not be the exact disease. You know many doctors in the past years had this ability. You know in my childhood I have. Uh, you know, my father took me to different types of doctors, including pediatricians. Only in rare cases, they would go for diagnostic testing. They will just physically test and come to a conclusion which was reasonably okay. That is why I'm alive till now, right? So uh, uh, that means they had better intuition, but more data means you have less intuition. Now it is, see, the, the intuition of counting. When we were very young, you know, uh, if, you know, 10 numbers were given. I had a way by which I could add them in a very logical way without actually physically going through the rule of addition, but using tens and, you know, the surplus from tens and counting together. Now that is lost because people will put in calculator and do it. So why that is not required? So it, it is, it has to be there. Where you have more tools, you have less effect of human intellect coming in. Nowadays, in many scientific studies, deep learning is being used for simulation purposes. So, is there any kind of approach exist in this field? Uh, see, deep learning, like in this these types of problems, deep learning is used typically what is in the so broad purview of physics informed neural network. So, um, uh, that is at the end it becomes you know data crunching, you know so to say. Because your training of the system, you know, how you look into the systems comes from data. So maybe your physical governing equation is not able to capture it, not because your governing equation is incorrect, because maybe some of the parameters you really do not have an idea on, or you are not resolving certain scales. So you are making a measurement, maybe, you know, say one meter apart, but your physics happens with, you know, one nanometer level. So you are not able to capture that and your equation is not reflecting. That's it. Yeah, that is fine, but there is a recent trend where the program that actually in many physical simulation simulation of many physical process, there is some problem of data sparsity, like uh, to simulate the process with sufficient accuracy, you need very large amount of data. Exactly. And 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 there has been a recent approach where people are using uh, uh, using deep learning. To make uh, to uh, to emulate a simulation uh, simulation model, which requires much less amount. Yeah, of that is that is there. You know, definitely. So, is there any such kind of? See, it all depends on you know how you are able to validate it. You know, I I talked about a problem which is from the clinical and the medical world. It has several other aspects of you know complexity. If you look into it from a fundamental physics point of view. So, for example, if you have a pipe and say water is flowing and you have you use such an approach, you, you are most certain that you will be able to do better job. But with human body, you do not know because uh, you, know, you are maybe having a set of data by which you are training your algorithm where the data itself is biased. And whether the medical data is biased or not, it is an aspect of research altogether. No, uh, what I am asking is that... Is no, no, you are talking about limited... Using no, limited data, right? Whether there is any existing work which basically explore this. No, no, there are lots of such existing works. Okay, okay, okay. Works are there, but the question is how effective they are. Okay. They are effective only when, see, it's like, it, uh, it's very similar to sampling theory in statistics. You have a sample mean and you have a population mean. You have a sample variation, you have population variation. So, you know, if you remember junior class statistics, people will ask you that, you know, how, accurate the sample theory will be to predict about the population. 
So the question is, you know, there is not just the number of data, but the quality of data, how much it has traversed and what are the real, you know, uh, sort of uh, very unique cases it has considered. So it's not basically number of data, but the choice of the data which will make it unbiased across the global population space, which is very difficult to get for the medical thing. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, uh, let us thank Professor Chakraborty for such a wonderful lecture. Many of us are not aware of this very important research domain, and I believe we have got a nice introduction to it. So, uh, we have a small memento for you, sir, from our department side. So uh, we also have arranged uh, lunch and uh, dinner around 7.30 in the evening and lunch around 1 p.m. Yeah. Yes, in the ground floor. Sure, sir. Thank you.